good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. I just realized I went around and shook hands with everybody in the church, and then I have to lick my fingers to hold this pick. <laughs> so if anybody has anything, I just got it. <laughs> Would you stand up? We did this song last week, just learned it. I want to start with it again today. You guys remember this. There's a lot of scripture in this song. I wanted to, I wanted to go through and write down all the scriptures in it today, but I, but I didn't get a chance to this week. But I'll do that when we do it in the sometime in the coming days. Well, I have a hope. I have a future. I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over. A new beginning's just begun. I have a home. I have this home. That's familiar, isn't it? Let's do the second verse. God has a plan for me. It's not to harm me, but it's to prosper me. And to hear me when I call, He intercedes for me. Working all things for my good eyes as they come. I have this hope. I will yet praise Him, my great Redeemer. I will yet stand up and give Him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and He turns it into light. I will yet praise Him, my God, my God. not against me, so tell me who then, tell me who shall I fear, he has prepared for me, great works he'll help me to complete, I have this hope, I have this hope. Yeah. 
all for being here today. You can be seated. Let me have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us, that you call us yours. Father, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we go through our service, we can worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. John three sixteen through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. First John 4, 10 says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son as his atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you forgive us where we have failed you, and you continue to lead, guide, and direct us in our daily lives. I pray that you, pray that those of us that have strayed, that you would guide us back to where we need to be. I pray you open our hearts and minds and help us to always remember that you sent your son to die on the cross for the sins of the saints and the sinners. I pray you help us to always realize the sacrifice you have made to show the amount of love you have for each of us. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you say, Trust in you with all of our hearts. Rely not on our own understanding. To acknowledge you in everything that we do, and you will make our paths straight. I pray that you give us strength in our daily lives for whatever we face, even in uncertainty. I pray for this church, and especially Pastor Allen, as he is the shepherd you have chosen to lead this flock. I pray you open our hearts and minds to the message you have given him. I pray for the sick and afflicted in our congregation. You know each of our needs. Finally, I pray you help us to realize the meaning of this time of the year. All these things I pray and ask for in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bless the Lord. This is the words of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. This was written 700 years before the birth of Christ. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. Please stand with us. Come, oh come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive That mourns in lonely exile here Until the Son of God Shall come to thee, O wind. 
thank you so much for the blessed hope that you have sent us in the Lord Jesus. Father, we just thank you for the time we have to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And God, I pray that in this service, Father, that we would give you all glory and praise and that we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. And it's in the Christ's name that I pray, amen. Good morning again. Hope you're doing well today. Thank you for your faithfulness. If you have your copy of the Lord's Word, I want to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we'll be reading one verse of Scripture, uh, verse 12, Acts four twelve, this morning. And today I want to talk to us about the Christmas miracle. The Christmas miracle. Let me ask you a question. Now, please don't answer it openly. I don't want to embarrass you in any way. But have you been secretly watching any of those cheesy Hallmark Christmas movies? Yeah, you have. I know you have. You know, you watch those little... And you know what? It, it's a predictable uh, storyline. You know what the plot's going to be. At the end, they need some kind of Christmas miracle to cri fix whatever crisis they've encountered. You know, maybe the, the, the lumber mill's going out of business and they need some stranger to come in and work those that week and suddenly everything changes. It's a Christmas miracle. You know, it only happens at Christmas. No one goes out of business on, in June or April. But the reality is, it's just some cheesy way of having a movie. But we all look for miracles in life. And today I want to talk to us about the real Christmas miracle. You know, if you, I guess if, we, if you had a miracle, maybe in a movie, we'd use it for ourselves too. But the reality is, the, the real Christmas miracle is none other than Jesus, as you know. And he came and gave the most selfless miracle in history, condescending and becoming a human being. I mean, think about that. He, he gave himself as a sacrifice for you and me. Now, think about it. When we read back in the Old Testament, the law, all the various laws that we had, all, and Paul sums it up, says the reason that we had the law was to teach us that we couldn't measure up. The only reason that the, the law was given to us was to illustrate the truth that we cannot measure up. We can't keep the law. And so we needed a Savior. We need a Redeemer. The only one that was sinless, unspotted, perfect. And he came as a sacrifice for us. He is our only hope. He is our Christmas miracle. So I want to ask you to stand with me. Let's read one verse of Scripture today, and let's talk about our Christmas miracle. Acts 4, verse 12, Scripture says, There is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that it contains, Father. Thank you for, for uh, letting us know about our wonderful Savior, Savior, your Son, and our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we open your word today, as we dive into your word, as we uh, allow your Holy Spirit to, uh, to open our eyes and our hearts to it, that we would just be present here. We have so many concerns in our life. So many things that are pulling us and our attention away, our hearts away. I pray that we would have the wherewithal just to focus in on what you're telling us today in your word to, so that we can be about your business as we leave this place. Thank you for loving us and for the, 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 uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus in our life. In his name we pray and amen. You can be seated and follow along in the outline there. And you know, as we said, Jesus is our Christmas miracle. Luke tells us that Jesus, in fact, is the Christ of Christmas. Luke 2, he says, For there was born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who was Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our miracle. The question is, we all accept the fact that Jesus is our Christmas miracle. How do we receive him? How do we live that miracle? How do we live that Christmas miracle the rest of the year? You've heard people say, well, I want that Christmas spirit all year long. How do we have that spirit that can come? Three things I want to point out this morning. Three aspects of the miracle that is Christ. First of all, the miracle of the name of Jesus. The miracle of the name. The scripture this morning says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name. Now, when you hear a name, you think uh, of, of, of a word. That's not what he's talking about here. A name is a person. A name is a person. Have you ever encountered somebody that shared your name? I've met a lot of people who were named Alan. And when I think about that person, I don't think about me. I don't even think about the name Alan. I think about that person, that man. 
He's as, he is as unique as any other person is. And we all have met people who had different names. He tells us here that he, there's no other name. There's no other person. No other individual. Yes, what's in the name? And, and everything's in the name. A name, we have identity. We have heritage. Isaiah tells us about the miracle behind Jesus' name, the person behind Jesus' name. In, in, um, in Isaiah 7, he says, The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. He is with us. Mary was a virgin, just a teenager. She birthed a son. The Christmas miracle and the Holy Spirit ushered into Mary's womb the life of the eternal Christ. Think about that. Emmanuel, God with us, Christ with us. Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He told that to Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is truly the God-man. We use that term quite a bit. I don't know that we really grasp that. Hebrews he says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. He was a man. He was tempted in every way as we are, but yet unspotted, perfect. He did not disqualify himself from being our sacrifice. He came and was our sacrifice. God, yet human, God with us. And folks, he was known by a name. We are all known by our names, for better or worse. You know, we've all said, well, you know how those Smiths are. You know? You know how those Englands are. <laughs> Good or bad, you know how they are. Name's very important. Very important. But let me ask you a question. Is there a greater name that you have ever heard than the name of Jesus? There's not a greater name. Mary and Joseph, you know, when uh, our kids were uh, expecting our grandchildren... Um, you know, they're all talking about the names. It's, it's fun when, the, when a, a, a lady gets pregnant and she's going to have a, a baby. That's a big part of it is figuring out what name. But Mary and Joseph didn't spend a lot of time deciding what the name would be. They didn't spend a lot of time to know what name they would give uh, their child. In fact, in, uh, in Luke 2, or I'm sorry, Matthew, the angel comes to Joseph and says, uh, she will give you a birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus. They were instructed what to name him. The angel told Joseph to name him Jesus. Jesus is the name. You know, in Hebrew, uh, one of my favorite names is, the name, is, is a Jesus' name in Hebrew, Yeshua. Isn't that a great name? Yeshua. It means Joshua in English. You hear the name Joshua? That's the English transliteration of uh, Yeshua. And it just simply means that Yahweh saves. You remember the name Yahweh? It was given to Moses by God himself in, in Exodus 3. He said, who may I send, send me? And he said, uh, I am that I am. That was, that was uh, Yahweh. And so the combination there is Yah, and then, and then uh, of the other part is uh, Yahshua, or Yasha, which is rescue, deliver. It means Yahweh saves, Yahweh delivers. Jesus means that he delivers us from God, or by God. You know, we hear about, about our names. You know, we always have people. You have like Peyton Manning, then you have Eli Manning. Or you have Alexander the Great, or you have, you know, uh, Judas Caesar. You can always come up with somebody that that's, has good names. One's good, and then you almost have someone that's almost as good. Or, and then you can't really, you can't find somebody that's better than another one. They're all about just the same. But folks, you write down the name of Jesus. You write down the name of Jesus, and there's no other name that you can place in the same strata as the name of Jesus. In fact, uh, Paul says, God highly exalted Jesus and gave him the name that is above every name. The name that is above every name. Even today, when you speak the name of Jesus, out in the world, he separates the sheep from the goats. There's a definite opinion about the name of Christ. That's why we're saying happy holidays in the world today, folks. Because the name of Christ means something, whether they want to admit that it means something or not. Jesus is the most important name in the universe. When, he, when his name is spoken, whether you accept it or reject it, it is the most important name in the universe. Why? Because he is the most important person in the universe. The miracle of the name of Jesus, but only that, the miracle of the love of Jesus. Now, I use the word love there. Because I could just as easily use a salvation or hope or peace or joy. 
I mean, it's an umbrella there. In Acts, he says salvation is found in no one else. We could put any of those other words there, love or, or peace. There's, salvation is found in no one, or, uh, uh, no one else other than Christ. John put it this way. He said God sent, or God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Now, I love that, that, that verse. He didn't say because so we could love through Him, so we could have peace through Him or joy, but so that we could find our own life through Him. That means that bef- without Christ, we're, we're dead. We don't have life. The only way that we can live is through the person of Jesus, through the name of Jesus. That's where we have our hope and our our joy, our peace, our salvation. It's only in Christ. His name describes love. Angel said you are are to name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people. Name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sin. God loves us and he sent Jesus because he loves us. And folks, we know that all who trust Jesus will be given uh, forgiveness and cleansing from sin, redemption, uh, eternal life. But the real miracle confronts our every need. I mean, go back to that Hallmark movie, the Christmas miracle fixes whatever crisis happens to be that particular week. And then next week's happening, right? It's coming. We just don't have a, a movie that week. Jesus comes in and confronts every need. He gives us hope, love, joy, peace, salvation. Who else could do this? Who else could provide that? Who else comes in and gives us the miracle of love? Only Jesus does that. In fact, here's how Paul put it in Philippians 2. Jesus Christ, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or as something to be used as his, at his own advantage. Instead, what did he do? He emptied himself. How? By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And and, and when he had become as a man, he humbled himself even further and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Jesus left heaven, became a man, born in a stable. He's been rejected by most people. He died on a cruel cross, which was the most uh, disgraceful execution of the day. Why? Because love was his mission. That's the miracle of love. He came because he loved us. He loved people that were rejecting him, even when he came. His coming to earth was his act of love. Folks, even while he was in his earthly ministry, his, his actions were love. His life demonstrated his love. I mean, he went around all the untouchables. Remember the lepers? He healed the lepers. Only one of them came back. (laughs) Can you imagine? Rejected even by the ones he was healing. Tax collectors, Gentiles, harlots, sinners, on and on. The Pharisees in Luke 15, they, they were fussing about him, and they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He even associates with them. He eats with them. You know what? You better believe that he eats with them because he still does it today. He still fellowships with us today, doesn't he? Jesus offers us his great love even today. And he provides us unity and relationship with the Father. And when we have that relationship with the Father, that provides unity and fellowship with everybody else. It gives us a means to know how to live, remember? We live in him. And it gives us understanding how we can interact and associate with one another. You know, Paul was talking about that in Ephesians 2. You remember that in the temple complex that the Gentiles could come and and go out in the the courtyard, but there was a wall there. And there was a sign on that wall. And it said, only Jews can come past this. And it's a capital offense if you pass by this on, on penalty of death. If a Gentile passed by that particular and went to that particular area, they were penalized by death. It was a capital offense. And Paul used that imagery in Ephesians 2, and he says, But now in Christ Jesus you are far away, and you have been brought near to the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who made both groups. That's what he's talking about, both groups. One, and he tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and express regulations so that he might create in himself one new man. Out of everybody, Gentiles, Jews, one man from two, resulting in peace. 
Jesus' mission was love. He came for the miracle of love. The Father showed his love by sending him, and Jesus showed his love by coming to be our Lord and our Savior. Luke 2. Mary shall bring forth her firstborn child, wrap him in swaddling clothes, and lay them in a manger. But there was no room for him in the end. Even as a little baby, he was rejected. How would you like trying to love somebody, and all you get is rejection, pushed away? I don't know about you. After the first time, I thought, Message received. I won't go around you anymore. I, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. I will not be in your business any longer. I think most of us feel that way, don't you? The greatest demonstration of love was Jesus coming and him coming to Calvary. He came to Calvary. He said in John 10, I have the authority to lay down my life and I also have the authority to take it up again. He came because he chose to. He came. That's the miracle of Christmas, folks. That's your Christmas miracle. Is that the Lord Jesus, in spite of all the rejection of this world, He came and gave Himself a sacrifice for us. He's the only one that a person can find or experience love or life in this world. You know, I've been in school most of my life, and all around all these theological institutions, they throw these big $5 words out about, about the Lord Jesus, about God, transcendent, sovereign, immutable, omniscient, on and on and on. Scripture says one thing, God is love. God is love. Now, I, there's a place for those things, I guess. But folks, we have to understand the miracle of Jesus is love. It doesn't get any better than God being love. Folks, if that's all we knew about Jesus, was that he loved us, it would be enough. He loves us. The miracle of his person, the miracle of his love, and folks, finally, the miracle of the bride of Christ. That's us. Those of us who are in Christ, we're the bride of Christ. Scripture says that salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to people, to mankind, to us which we should be saved. Folks, I believe people don't love the church today as much as they used to. I believe that in my heart. I believe that we love structure. I believe that we love music. We love programs. We love philosophy and strategy. We love all that stuff. But in terms of loving the body, I don't know about that. I think you look around the world today, it's true. But folks, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the family of God. I mean, think about it. What a blessing, follow along with me, what a blessing to be able to be a blessing to others. What a blessing to be blessed by others. You know, in a family, people say, well, I can't really let you do anything for me. In a family, you don't have a choice. They're going to make you accept their blessings, aren't they? That's what we are. We're a family of God. It's just one of many ways that God takes care of us. Let me just read you something. This is how the world is. This is how the world is. This is 2 Timothy 3, Paul talking to Timothy. He says, but you know that hard times are coming in the last days. That's where we are, folks. For people are going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents. Sound familiar? Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers. Without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's our world right there. Holding on to, it, to the form of godliness, but denying his power. He says to avoid these people. That's the world that we're living in, isn't it? But here's how Isaiah described what the Lord would do for his bride. 700 years before the Lord came, he said, Isaiah says, He will feed the flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. What a contrast. What a contrast. Folks, we can go out in this world where everybody knows everything but knows nothing. You know what I mean? They go out here, everybody's an expert, but it really doesn't have any idea how to tie their shoe. Or we can come in and find true love in Christ and be around like-minded believers in his, in his fellowship. Why? Because we have the miracle of Jesus, his name, his love, his bride. Folks, that's how we have Christmas spirit all year long. That's how we have that miracle all year long. The church must love like Christ loves. The church must do what the Lord gives us. That's where we have that hope and peace 
That's why we have the, 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 the comfort that we need. Jesus told us that we have to love like he loves. The bride, he's telling us, straighten up and do what I tell you to do. John 13, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. Now, that love he's talking about isn't your definition of love. It's not my definition of love. It's his definition of love. And we've just described and, and seen what the scripture says about how he loves us. He loves us without restraint. He loves us and it costs him everything. He loves us and takes on the sin of the world and is separated from his father. Rejected by everybody, most, most everybody. And he comes and he gives us that love. And he tells us that we should love one another in the bride, in the church, the way that, that he loves. Paul says in, in Ephesians 4, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unit of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's how we interact with one another. With humility, gentleness, patience, love, eager, eager to maintain the unity. Eager. I fear sometimes we're eager to have disunity because I want my way. Eager to maintain the unity. Romans 12 says, be, Paul says, be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourself. What's well, hard, isn't it? He says that we have to love one another above ourselves. Above ourselves. I, I love this one. When a man's, this is Proverbs, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies at peace with him. Isn't that true? We have to love like Jesus. Folks, that's where we have our Christmas miracle. You want a Christmas miracle in your life today? You want to understand how to have Christmas spirit all year long, to have the miracle of Jesus working in and through you as you walk down life's way? First of all, we got to give our lives to Christ in the name of Jesus. Have to have a relationship with Jesus himself, the person of Christ. We have to experience that love, that salvation, the miracle that only can, he can give us. The restoration, the unity that he can give us with, with the Lord Jesus and with, with the Father. And then we have to work and love in the church, in the bride of Christ. Fidelity, faithfulness. That's how we love. We don't love like the world we love like Christ. That's how we love like Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our time that we've enjoyed here in your word. And I pray that as we come to this time of decision, Father, I pray that you would have your way in each of our lives, that your will would be accomplished in our life. Father, I pray that, that your people would be responsive to the tugging of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. And Father, that we would uh, do what you've called us to do. Thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. And amen. I want to invite you to stand. This invitation is for you. This time is for you to be obedient to whatever the Lord's calling you to do. And I know we get, we get caught up in the routine of, of a worship service even. But I want you to, to, to just allow the Holy Spirit to use, to use your, uh, your walk with Him to, to, to direct you as, you, uh, as He will. So you come as we sing and you do business with the Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see.
for your faithfulness and we're going to go in a moment to the fellowship hall and have a family meal so we want you to be a part of that and brother mike's going to pray over that food in just a moment before he comes let me just say a couple things we will be uh having our uh our uh, wednesday night uh prayer meeting time this wednesday in the fellowship hall i'll be just doing a, a regular bible study we've ended our courses but we're going to meet this week and so we want you to come and be a part of that also, next Sunday morning is uh, Christmas Eve, and we have a very special worship uh, service planned. We want you to be a part of that. We'll be having the Lord's Supper and some other uh, activities as well during the service. Certainly have Sunday school, so you come to that as well. But you bring your uh, friends and your family, uh, especially this coming uh, Lord's Day as we celebrate uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas as well. And so uh, keep those in mind. The Lord's good to us. Look forward to seeing you in the fellowship hall. Brother Mike, if you come and pray for us.